Good evening. This lecture will be the sponsor of the Refuat Ruven Ben Chava and also Leilu Nishmat Levi Leon Leib Yitzchak Ben Perlu and Meir. And also for Refuat Shlema of Moshe Ben Avigail, Moshiach Ben Avigail, and also Refuat Moshiach Ben Tzori Shaddai, Shnei Moshiach. בן אהרון, משיח צורי של אהרון, שני משיח ניץ רפואה. לא, לרפואת משיח צורי שדי, ולרפואת משיח בן אביגיל, שני משיחים ניץ רפואה, משיח בן יוסף, משיח בן דוד. וואה, that's a sign from שמיים, maybe. טוב, as you probably all aware of the news, Today is a very, very, very bad day, very difficult day. The lefties, the Arabs, the gays, and the righty traders joined together to form a government in Israel. It's terrible news for a few reasons. One, uh, I don't have to tell you what lefties are. They are the real enemies of the nation of Israel for decades. You can see what's going on here in a democratic party in America multiplied by 10. That's how bad the Israeli left is. They are such traitors that they go to the Hague court in Holland, try to beg them to prosecute Israeli soldiers for giving their life to save us from the Hamas. This is the kind of head they have, these, these people. So they are now in charge. Join them, the number one anti-Semite person on earth, Avigdor Lieberman, Imach Shimo, is a, officially a Nazi. He has Nazi opinions. Everything comes out of his mouth when it comes to religion. It's word by word like Hitler. I think that's where he learned his speeches from, because it's one to one, word by word. You can see the commercials they made for the election to the Russian people in Israel. He knows they're all anti-Semites, they're non-Jewish. They came from Russia, Ukraine. So they hate Jews. They got $15,000 a person, so they brought them to Israel to be in opposition to the religious growing party. So he took advantage on it. He speaks Russian. He realized they're all, you know, anti-Semite. He became their hero. The more he speaks against religious Jews and how you should dump them to the garbage and all kinds of words like that, the more they love him. So you have Nazis inside Israel. Arabs who just showed you that they want to slaughter all of us a week ago. They made riots in the cities of Israel. So they're now in a government. The party of all the gays, which now they are in a government, they're also very lefty. And uh, another lefty one, which the woman over there speaks in, a, in, in Hebrew, when you speak in general, when you speak to the plural, you speak in a male language. She decided to reinvent the language. She's a, a big feminist cuckoo, so she's now speaking in a different way than everyone. She makes her own language. This is the type of people we're dealing here now. And the worst part of this, I wouldn't be worried so much because anyway the Israeli Supreme Court is the representative of these wicked people. So nothing is, nothing is really changing because the Israeli Supreme Court anyway control Israel. The government is just a, a dummy. It's not a real government because the Supreme Court decide whatever they want, they can cancel any rule. The problem is that this Nazi Lieberman is going to be in charge of all the money in Israel. And that's a real disaster. That's really a real tragedy. Because I don't have to tell you what's going to happen now. It's going to shut down the budgets to all the religious education, to all the yeshivot. There will be tens of thousands of bachure yeshivot with a little bit they used to get from the government. Not a lot, $170 a month. It was mamash food for their own little children. They're going to cut it all off. Is going to start fighting the yeshivot because he's all officially a real anti-Semite. He cannot stand religion. You have to see how he talks. So scary to hear him. 
If it was up to him, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever. No doubt in my mind. If he could press a button and kill a million religious Jews in Israel in a second, he would do it. There's no question in my mind about it. The other lefties, maybe they would, maybe they're not. I don't know. But him, for sure, yes. You can see the type of person he is. He is going to be in charge of the money of the yeshivot in Israel. And that's a tragedy. Why is it happening? Let's face it. We eat now what we cooked. We deserve it. The religious people in Israel deserve it. Hashem was merciful enough for who knows how many years with his patience, hoping that we will stop, hoping that we will do real tshuva, hoping that the racism will stop and it's going to be more unity, hoping that all the fakeness will go away and people will really start working on themselves. In reality, everything became worse and worse and worse. We became a religion of idol worshippers. Half of the religious people follow graves of tzaddikim. That's their God. This rabbi who died and that rabbi that died, everyone has a God of his own. Messianics, all kinds of cults, unfortunately. And people left the main thing in Judaism and focus on the secondary things. Instead of Torah, and Musar, and Irat Shamayim, and good Midot, and Chesed, the most important thing to fix, to fix the lifestyle that we live in. Uh, it only, we only got worse, we didn't get any better. So one tragedy after the other. Came the Corona, thousands of religious people died. If you had London and New York, a lot of religious people died. It wasn't enough to get the point. The politic and the corruption continue. Then came the tragedy of Meron. 45, 45 real righteous people died. Not everyone who looks religious is righteous. You know, I see it every day. But those 45 that died were really pure people. Almost all of them were learning all day Torah. And they were all very young. Some of them did not reach 18 even. Kids that sit in yeshivot seriously and learn. So there was a very serious tragedy, and another tragedy, and another problem, and then came the war with the Arabs. You would think by now maybe we'll learn something. I already had a feeling that this week we're going to get the knife in our heart. Why did I have the feeling? Because every, today was the ultimatum, by midnight in Israel, which is 5 p.m. here. At 4 p.m. they reach an agreement, all the parties. The gays, the lefties, the Arabs, the traders, they were arguing, I want more. Everybody wants a bigger piece than, uh, from the cake. So they be arguing, it looked like they may fail. But an hour before, they reached peace, all the Rishayim. I already had a feeling that that's what's going to happen. Why did I have a feeling? Because usually what hap whatever happened in the week in the world, always have a hint in the parasha. We are between parashat Baalotcha into parashat Shlach. What's parashat Shlach? In parashat Baalotcha, it tells us the names of the presidents, the leaders. And in parashat Shlach, he sends, Moshe sends them to Israel to spy on the land. And they were all religious people. And they were all basically politicians. They decided to speak bad about the land of Israel for personal reasons. They did not want to get fired and lose their control. Once they moved to Israel, they divide the land and they reassign different leaders. It's a different story. You are leaders here in the desert. Now we won't move to Israel. Everything will be divided and then we're going to need different leaders. So to prevent them being fired and lose their honor and control for political reasons, they started to make everybody scared and they spoke very bad about the land. And what happened in the end? HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a serious punishment. Because I've seen that there is a hint in the parasha about what's going to happen. I had a very bad feeling that that's what's going to happen. 
And again, if Lieberman would not become the treasury, I wouldn't care so much. Because anyway, for me, there's no difference. The Supreme Court, which is very lefty and enemies of Israel, they already run Israel for more than 20 years. 30 years, maybe. They are the final decision makers, so it really doesn't matter who are the politicians so much. Because anyway, when the righties were trying to pass a law, comes the Supreme Court and cancel it. So, so it's just an illusion. Like you think, oh, the righties are in power. But Netanyahu was a bird with no wings. They chopped his wings from day one. Now there's only one, one really serious tragedy that the yeshivot is going for another horrible round, what happened eight years ago. Remember eight years ago? Same people, Lapid was the treasury, and he cut 50%, and a lot of Bachure yeshivot were kicked out of yeshivot because there was no room for them and no money. It was a big disaster, spiritual, spiritual tragedy. But the one that now took over is 10 times worse. Both of them hate religious people. But Lapid is doing it more in a class, meaning he's afraid what people would say about him. So he's a little bit conservative. This one is a real animal. Doesn't care about anyone. He's a spy for Putin. He's already working with Putin. Putin defends him. He gets millions of dollars wired to his account and to his daughter account. They call him for investigation. He laughs at their face. What are you going to do? He parks his car on a sidewalk everywhere he goes. He doesn't care. Everyone's afraid of him. Much like a gangster, mafia. We fell today in his hands. That's what's happened. You know, we do not know what Hashem's plans are. We never know. Maybe... Maybe Hashem decided that he's going to destroy everything that we believed in. That we will come to a realization in the end. What the Gemara in Masechet Sota say, And we will come to the conclusion that we can only rely on Hashem and no one else. Not the police, not the Israeli army, Israeli army not the mercy of the Israeli Arabs. Not the politicians, not the righties, nothing. You know, there is a video today they publish. Even the lefties make fun at this Bennett, Yerovam ben Navat, Navat Otiot Bennett. He was supposedly righty all the time, screaming, I'm righty, I'm anti left. I will never sit with the left. How can I sit with them against my ideology? I give you my word, everybody listens, it's live on television. I will never dare to sit with the left. Here, you want me to sign it for you? I'm signing in front of the whole nation. I will never sit with the left. The left are enemies. You had to see how he ran after the left three days later to sit with them. How can a person be so dirty? I never seen in my life such a dirty person. Not even among secular people, I didn't see anything like this. Not among Goim. I never saw such a dirty person, even among politicians. To lie in such a way your own voters? You know, six, six seats in the Knesset he has, it's 240,000 people voted for him. Each one of them is fuming now. They are righties, and he turned them into an Arab he went with the Arabs and the leftists. Do you know what it is to cheat your voters like this? this they call it in the headlines in Israel, the scam, the biggest scam in Israel history. That's the headlines today. They never saw something like this in their life. Even on politics, even in the, by the dirtiest politician. And he's going to be the, the prime minister. That's the bribe they gave him. He has only six seats. Lapid has 17 seats. La Pizza Yubi, the Prime Minister first, will make rotation. First two years you'll be, then I'll take over. Can you believe that? A person that got, Netanyahu got 33 seats, he cannot be Prime Minister. La Pid got 17, he won't be Prime Minister. This clown got six, he's going to be the Prime Minister.
maybe, maybe, maybe you, are, you give them too much benefits of the doubt to this Rishayim. Nothing here is surprising, not to me at least. Rav Ovadia Yosef Zatzal in his speech called them Miflaga Shel Goim. They called themselves the Jewish home. Rav Ovadia said there's nothing Jewish about them. They're worse than reform. They're worse than reform. He speaks very highly about reform. It shows you who he is. So those naive people who thought that his little yarmulke on his head means something, it means that he's the number one trader in the history of Israel. That's what it means. That's reality now. Nobody ever did such a dirty trick in politics in the history. I don't think in any country. I don't think in any country. Imagine Trump. Everything he said before the election, as soon as you know, the election came, he said, okay, I'm joining Bernie Sanders. And we're going to be one party together. People would hospitalize him in a mental institution. After all these speeches against the left, you go and make a, a, a government with Bernie Sanders. Now we have 20 Bernie Sanders controlling us. Now one, 20. 20. You want to hear something said? There is one Arab, he has, I think, four or five seats. They're, they're the puzzle that needed to complete to 61 seats. Mansur Abbas, his name. I think he's a dentist, something like that. He said to them, you want me to join your, your, your government? In one condition. You, you, you sign that you're not going to promote any homosexual rights. The Arab told these garbage lefties, I'm willing to be with you. After all, they serve his agenda. They help the Arabs to destroy us. So he likes them. But he doesn't like that they promote uh, <laughs> gay rights. Right away they agree. All of a sudden they don't have an ideology when it comes to Arabs. When it comes to religious, they fight to the end to destroy us. When it comes to the Arab, they have no problem to surrender in a second. But you want to hear something even more interesting? Lieberman, which is going to be the, the treasury, Sign to the Arabs that he's going to give them. You're sitting tight. You're sitting, hold your chair tight. 40 billion shekel. The budget of all religious people in Israel for a year is 1 billion shekel. And he burned us nonstop on the media. Uh, parasites, worthless. You're taking money, you're costing the taxpayers money for one billion for the entire year. Before he even started, he signed to the Arab 40 billion shekel. We're going to have to pay for all these terrorists who called to kill us now a week ago on the streets. We will release Palestine with blood and, and war. A week ago, the same people that now is controlling us, a week ago was screaming to slaughter us and they won't rest until they slaughter us. They are sitting in the government now. Tomorrow when the Arabs will shoot rockets, they cannot retaliate, because right away they say, okay, so we break the government. If you're going to shoot against the Hamas, we, we resign. <laughs> That's it. Not that the leftist wants to shoot the Hamas, it's the best friend. They rather that they will shoot at the road, because there's a lot of Sfaradi people there, and some of them are religious, than to attack the Hamas, these lefties. They are the real enemies. But that's, now it's became a very complicated salad to understand what's going on. So what happened this year? What happened this year? 200 billion shekel deficit from Corona. Another 40 billion goes to these terrorists. Who knows how many billions will go to lefty causes now? So all the money goes to the enemies of Hashem. And not only that, on top of all this, thousands of people died from Corona and the, the, the country was shut, shut down. Shut down. Third problem, no Jews can make Aliyah anymore to Israel. No one. One out of a thousand get approved. That's it. That's really what's going on right now. 
usually reform gays. They want them. They don't want religious people. They even made an it's, it's scary, everything I said happened in details. I said that already a few, three, two, three months ago, that you cannot make Aliyah. Two days ago, there was a big article in the newspaper. No one can make Aliyah. They shut down the border. Everyone who apply already for years, two or three years, they keep giving them the same request. But they gave them what they want. They, it's like never happened. Give us this and this and that. But I gave it to you five times already. You have it in your record. No, you have to give it to us. They make up things to stall time. So now, they don't want to, the reason they don't let anyone make Aliyah is because 99% of the people that wants to make Aliyah are Orthodox Jews. They don't want us there. They want to control Israel and make Israel Saddam. We are an obstacle for them. They know nobody else make Aliyah. What American secular Jews wants to make Aliyah now? They have no connection to Israel. They made a survey. They don't feel any connection to Israel, the secular Americans. Besides few crumbs of Zionists, but they're not in a position to make Aliyah. The only ones that wants to make Aliyah is French Jews, and they're all religious almost, and American Jews, which are Orthodox, they are the one who wants to make Aliyah. And that's why they shut the border. It started even before Corona. Corona came to them like a treasure. They use it as an excuse. Okay, but Corona is over. Israel is open now. Nobody can make Aliyah. If you want to make Aliyah to Israel, listen to me now carefully. Don't apply to Nefesh Benefesh. Don't apply to the Israeli agency. Just go to Israel as a tourist and just stay there. While you're there, while you're there, try to apply for Aliyah. You tell them, no matter what, I won't leave Israel. I'm here. I have nowhere to go. So you, I'm here with or without your approval. Now, do you want to give me papers or no? Or I should go to the court? They can kick you. It's not like in America. America, they can take you and kick you out. Not anymore. With Sleepy Joe, it's not going to happen. But with Trump, they could take you and kick you out if you're not legal here. But in Israel, they, at least until now, it was the country of all Jews. Every Jew has the right to make Aliyah to Israel and he's supposed to get a citizenship. But when these leftists took over, they made sure nobody goes to Israel. Last year, before Corona, 3,150 people made Aliyah. Only a third of them were Jewish. The two-thirds were not Jewish, not Jewish people. And from the third that were Jewish, this is not even a thousand people. This year almost nobody made Aliyah. Almost nobody. I got hundreds of emails from people that listens to my lectures. They told me, you're so right. Everything you say in your lecture happens to me. They keep telling me the same thing, making up excuses. Bring me the birth certificate of your uncle and his wife from Uzbekistan. But we want the original. <laughs> what do you have to do with my aunt and my uncle? And what aunt and uncle will agree to give an original birth certificate? It's the only document they have to prove that they came from USSR and they got citizenship here as, as, a, as a, not refugees or political asylum or whatever you want to call it. Who would give? It's like, some, it's like telling someone, give me your original passport. Passport you can, re you can reproduce. You can apply, you have a picture of it, you go and they're going to give you a new passport. Where are you going to get a birth certificate from Uzbekistan? Or from other, because in a birth certificate it's a USSR and this country doesn't exist. Actually, I know one guy uh, that he was from, uh, I think it was uh, Kafkazi, and he has in his passport USSR, and he committed a serious crime, and they wanted to kick him out of the United States and cancel his green card. And they, legally, they could not uh, send him away because the country that he was born doesn't exist. It's a USSR and there's no more USSR. That's how he got saved in America 
There was, there was one miracle that happened to him. Then he sat in jail for two years. They wanted to convict him to give him 30 years in prison. And after two years, they didn't have strong evidence against him. Enough to hold him court, they released him. Released him, two years. They released him, two miracles. One, they wanted to throw him out of the country. Second, they held him as much as they could and they had to let him go. So, this is what's going on. But, again, like I said, what does Hashem want that he's attacking the Orthodox Jews? I can make you a list of possibilities. Not that I know for sure. I'm not a prophet. To know for sure, you need to be a prophet. And in this generation, no one is a prophet. The like Gemara already said 2,000 years ago, there's no prophet. But I can tell you based on what I see. Based on reality. So first thing, the fakeness of our lifestyle. Materialism. One of the leaders of the Sephardi Orthodox communities, politician, Mary's daughter, a week ago, 10 days ago, spent 20,000 shekel on her wedding gown. It's a lot in Israel. It's almost like $20,000 here. Made a wedding. Someone that was there sent me a video. 20 girls on the left, 20 girls on the right, the girl sitting on a special stage like a queen with 20 stairs round. She sits on a chair like Queen Esther or Queen Vashti, I don't know. And 20 girls with violins playing all kinds of music. 20 on both sides. I don't have to tell you that each one of them is probably $300 for the night, at least. Right? So you had about 40 of them. Just for five minutes to come and connect the violin to the system, ta 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 you know, for the show off. And then I don't have to tell you about the food, and the band, and the orchestra, bottom line, all this lifestyle of the goyim took over the lifestyle of the Haredim, not just the secular Jews. That could be one thing that makes Hashem very angry at us. Instead of living simple lifestyle, no, no show off, none of these things. You don't need a wedding seven floors. I went to some weddings in my life. I could not believe the amount of food goes to the garbage by the end of the night. A real crime. They're committing crime in the night of the wedding to get Hashem angry at them. Thousands of thousands of dollars goes down to the garbage after two hours. Like this, 100 pieces of salmon shh, slided into the garbage. In my own eyes I saw. Thank God they pick up the whiskey and the wine. That's it. No food. All the food goes to the garbage. Platters of sushi. Garbage. Each platter is $150. To the garbage. Dozens of them. Lamb, kebab, chickens, lots of desserts. Shh. To the garbage. Why? The waiters wants to go home. Why do you make, I ask a couple, why do you make such a stupid fancy wedding? Everybody does in our community. But you're poor. I took loans. So how many years is it going to take you to pay this stupid wedding? Years. If I won't do it, people will say we are cheap. Peer pressure. Psychological pressure by wicked people around, show of clowns who wants to destroy our community even more and more with their materialism. That's what's happening. That could be one reason for all our suffering. We became goyim. So why would Hashem protect us? <laughs> if an Arab has to preach to us, I will join the government in one condition that you left your garbage ideology and stop brainwash us with your gay uh, propaganda, then I will sign. And they had to sign that they will not promote homosexuality in Israel because Mr. Mansour Abbas getting upset. I don't care Hashem gets upset. Abbas gets upset. That's what they worry about. They need him in the government. That could be one thing. Second thing is 
What's happening in yeshivot? Lots of politics. There's one yeshiva used to be the best in the world. Became Sodom and Gomorrah. People beat each other there every day, cursing each other. Every day the police is there. Who would ever imagine such thing? Some of them knows the whole Gemara by heart almost. They know so much Torah. And they behave worse than dogs. It's an insult to the dogs to compare them to dogs, how they behave. Would you ever believe that a person that walks with a black hat and a tzitzit take a stand there like this and throw it at the rabbi in the middle of his speech, a Talmid Chacham? That's that penalty right there. No shame. And the second thing is the Chilul Hashem when the Israeli police come, secular cops, to break the, the fight. This, what's happening in that yeshiva, it's enough to destroy all of us. Just this alone. If that's the reason for all our problems, I don't know, only Hashem knows. I didn't say that I know. I'm just bringing options up. One other thing. Horrible, horrible amount of people go off the derech. Kids. Drug pandemic. So many kids die from drugs. The internet destroyed almost every religious home. Almost every religious home. It leads to intermarriage. It leads to horrible mental sicknesses. Lots, thousands of thousands of teenagers have no future. Their future is destroyed before they became 18 already. Their life is over. It's very difficult to do something about it. Now it's almost too late to do something about it. The idea is why did you let it go to that situation? Where were we all this time when these things started to happen? So Hashem said, you know what? What's left here? That could be a reason for all the suffering. The amount of Lashon Hara, Sinat Chinam, horrible, filthy, dirty curses online, non-stop, around the clock in every article. Every article that is published, even in those filthy websites that call themselves religious, yeshiva, shabbat, all these names they choose. They are even more wicked than the secular. The damage they did to the religious people and the magazines, the religious magazines, it's a spiritual holocaust what they did. Almost every boy and girl that went to good yeshivot or to Bet Yaakov yeshivot, became corrupted in their ideology from those magazines and those religious news website. You have to see how, what kind of clowns they bring to spread their rotten ideology against Hashem with the name of religion. We are religion. You have to see the advertisement they allow over there. Everything massive brainwash. Dubai, Miami, Passover here in Puerto Rico, Cancun. Forty years ago, Rav Victor Miller, 30 years ago, when the problem was now 1% of what it is today, already screamed about it, that someone who leaves his house in Pesach and go to be in a hotel cannot be called religious. That was 30 years ago, when the hotels were 100 times more modest than today. 100 times more modest. And the people were a hundred times better than today. You do the math now, how, how horrible it became. You sit in a hotel with all the naked people coming in and out from the, from the swimming pool, all the goim over there, Mexican, European, your little yeshiva children, they have to see naked people in the middle of Lela Seder. What do you think? That's what Hashem wanted when he said the holy night, Lel Shimurim. That's what he had in mind. That you'll be in Miami Beach over there with all the prutzim and prutzot over there. And background music in the lobby of the hotel. Maybe some rock and roll music. Maybe you want some Led Zeppelin in the middle of Manishtana. Maybe you change the tune a little bit, no? You're smiling, but that's, that's, for me it's a reason to cry, not to smile. So I just gave you four or five optional reasons. In the end, only Hashem knows why. But we know one thing. We are obligated to investigate when Hashem gives us punches and tragedies 
and to try to understand what he's signaling to us. My, uh, in my humble opinion, the fact that Hashem gave us such a tragedy in Meron, in the night of Lagba Omer, and took 45 tzaddikim, which equal to thousands of regular people, in my opinion, the message is, you don't have to agree with me, of course, everyone is entitled for his own understanding. My understanding here, that Hashem say, enough is enough. I'm tired of what the religion became. Everything is about hilulot, hilula, hilula, hilula. That's all you hear about. Hilula of this, hilula of that rabbi, hilula of this rabbi. What do we become a religion of parties? What, 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 what's going on over here? People who left the yeshivot in Yerushalayim in Bnei Brak, closed the Gemarot for two days, Thursday and Friday, and went to celebrate and then someone lighting a candle. That became the main thing in the Torah. So Hashem gave us the punishment right there with hundreds of thousands of people. Unfortunately. So you understand, Rabotai? That's what's happening here. And then people say, wow, what a terrible two years we have. Did you realize it only get worse every week? Do you understand, right? You understand that it only get worse. Just when you think you saw everything, the next morning another surprise come, and another one, and another one. I want to ask you a question. The spies, they were sent on a mission. Go and see the land. My, what, what's the land? The, the goyim, the nations that sits there. Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it a lot? Or maybe not so big nation? How is the land? Is it a good land? Is it a bad land for agriculture? The cities, are they surrounded, surrounded with walls or they open? Why do you need to know that? If the land is good or bad, you need to know. You go to uh, Spring Valley, to Monsi, it's called Rockland uh, County. County. Rockland County. Why Rockland? I one time wanted to plant a few trees in my uh, little garden. It took my heart out. Something that should have taken 20 minutes took a whole day. Everywhere I, stu everywhere I stuck the shovel, trying to make a hole, boom, hit a huge rock. Now you don't know how big the rock is. So you try to go around it. So you say, okay, let me move five inches to the right. Make a hole, boom, you hit the rock. Okay, let me move another five inches to this side. Boom. In the end, after you made a huge hole in your, in your garden, you see a rock like three watermelons. It's called Rockland County. You don't want land like this. It's very hard to plant things over there. There are three qualities of land the Gemara described. The best one called Edith. Superb clean from rocks, soft sand. Whatever you plant there, grow immediately and very well. It absorbs water, very good. Some girls call Edith in Israel. Edith, meaning that she's the best out of the options. Top. Then you have Benonit. Not the best, but also not the worst, 50-50. And then you have the worst one, it's called Ziburit. Very hard to plant anything there. Ziburit will be Rockland County. You know? Maybe it is upstate New York. I see they have a lot of farms there. So I guess the land is good there, no? Maybe, I don't know. In the north of Israel, they have good lands. In the Galilee. Over there, there's a lot of farmers. So the three different kinds of land. So oh, the land, you need to check. How many goyim are there? Million, three million, half a million. It's important to know who we're going to fight. Are they strong? They have strong weapons. They don't have weapons. They have lots of horses. 
When you go to a war, you have to make your homework before. But why do they need to know if the cities are surrounded with walls or not? So you think, you think they want to know if we have to occupy this goyim, do we have to deal with a wall? Meaning we have to train how to climb, to throw ropes, or, some, or they're going to hide from the top and shoot at us all kinds of arrows. Or if it's open, so we run directly with the spears, with, the shell, with shield and spears. That's how they used to fight with the horses. They, they want to plan the strategy of the war. How long, by the way, it took to occupy Israel? Do you know? Seven years. Seven years war with the help of Hashem. After we had the promise that that's what's going to happen, that we're going to kick this going out. Seven years. Seven nations, seven years. And how many years it took to divide the land to the tribes? Also seven years. Today it will take seven weeks. You have lasers, you have ways to measure. Back there it was primitive way. You have to measure every land, divide it. You have to walk 10,000 steps with a rope and then go to the left, and then go again to the left, and you have to, real, you have to first measure the whole country, you have to divide it to 12 tribes. It's a very hard job. And then once you divide it to the tribes, you have to divide it to families. Each family needs a piece of land. And you have to calculate it probably based on how many children they have, maybe a couple with no children, and a couple with 10 children is not the same, no? They need a little bit bigger. It's difficult to, to do such things. Obviously, you need siyata dishmaya. <laughs> so what happened here, Abotai? Seven years to occupy, seven years to divide. <sighs> why? So you think that's the reason why they need to know if there is a wall or not. No, the answer is no. What's the significance if you come to a wall to occupy a country? and you see that the, the cities are surrounded with walls, and the, all the cities are not surrounded with walls. Which one is better, that they will be surrounded with walls, surrounded. or they should not be surrounded with walls? So the first thing you think, who wants walls? It's very difficult to break the walls. It's a hundred times harder to occupy the city with a wall. The Romans, the biggest empire in the world took them three years to make the people of Jerusalem surrender because it was surrounded uh, with a wall. They just could not do it. Three years. They waited until the Jews surrendered because they ran out of food. They ran out of food. If we had food for another three more years, they would stay there three more years. So what do we see? Technically, we would rather without walls, but it's exactly the other way around. Why? When you see walls, you know they are cowards. They are not strong. That's why they need walls. If they don't have walls, that means they're confident that nobody can even tickle us, not to talk about fight us. Why should we bother make a wall? Anyone who try to mess with us will butcher them. So if you see the whole country doesn't have walls, wow, that's panicking. Look how secure they are they're with themselves. They're not worried. They didn't even make bunkers, no nothing. But if it's like the Arabs, the biggest cowards in the history of the world, they make bunkers four flights under the ground with another shield and another one. As soon as the Israelis start to retaliate to the rockets, like mice, all of them run and hide inside. They prepared enough food, olive oil with za'atar, lots of packages of bread. Everything is ready, tuna cans. They're ready to leave their ear under the ground, these mice, the cowards. They're never going to come out and fight. They let the children die. They all run and hide, all these famous terrorists, mass murderers, smiling to the camera. As soon as they hear the first bomb, Akhbarim, running, run for your life. And they hide under the ground. And then we have the Israeli army, which is very good with lies and politicians and PR. 
we destroyed the Hamas, this time we gave it to them, they never saw it coming, this time we shocked them, we destroyed their tunnel, two or three weeks later, everybody realized it was all baloney and, and fairy tales. You did not destroy one tunnel, you did not destroy one mass murderer, you only killed some children and some women that they put in the front to hide, and few, few terrorists, but nothing major eh, that can be replaced in a second. Remember, over there, you have only two options, either to be a construction worker or a murderer. That's the only way to make money. If you're a construction worker, so you work in Gaza or you work in other places, you build, you fix, you expand homes. So you have parnasa, you make a living. If you come to work in Israel, you make double. Because the Israelis will pay you double, 800 shekel a day for an Arab worker. And he starts at 10, finish at 4. Like a lawyer. <laughs> Why does he know? To put bricks and make a wall and listen to his Arabic music every two minutes. Gever, tachin li kafe. You also work for him. That's what the Gemara says. Avadim mashlu banu poreket mi adam. He sees you with your jacket and your tie. He sees that he works in your house. He's the worker and you the boss. But he gives you orders. Go make me coffee. <laughs> we, we gave them Switzerland. They got used to it. They have no obligation whatsoever. They don't pay taxes. They don't need permits. They do whatever they want, everything for free. They don't have to pay income tax. They don't have to pay ta anything, nothing whatsoever. And uh, they go to university. We have to pay 104,000 shekels for each student of them to become a doctor on our expense. That they take over the hospitals. And now, when we have this war, they put in their Facebook page, we must slaughter all the Jews. Everyone join the jihad. Doctors that works in Israeli hospitals. We made them doctors. And they already tell you, we have to slaughter you because that's every Muslim must join the jihad. And tomorrow you have an operation and this Ahmed has to operate on you. You understand what Hashem did to us? It could never be worse than that. It's not only we are weak and we are dying and we are losing, we are being humiliated. It's such a difficult thing to bear to our ego that these donkeys are controlling us and make fun at us in our face and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's written where? In the Torah. The only book that predicted that is the book of God. No one would ever imagine such thing. I want to remind you, the Torah was written 3,300 years ago. Do you know at that time, there were barely any Arabs in the world? It was only 200 years after Ishmael. Abraham Avinu was about 200 years before. So how many people Ishmael had? Five generations. 500 Arabs? A thousand Arabs came out of Ishmael in a period of 200 years? A thousand? Five thousand Arabs? That's it. There's no Arabs. Definitely didn't have countries or armies. And already the Torah told you, Ishmael Pere Adam Yadov Bakol Viat Kolbo is a wild beast. And the Torah speaks about the enemies that live among you will rise higher and higher and you will sink lower and lower. They will revenge against you with a sword. You would live in fear and paranoia. Even when they don't attack you, you will run for your life. It's all written in Parashat Bechukotai. Who would ever be able to write such a, such a thing in a book? How many years before we enter Israel? Forty years before. We got the Torah seven weeks after we came out of Egypt. And we enter Israel 40 years later. So this was written in the Torah already 40 years before we even enter Israel. Look at the prophecy. And when we enter Israel, it didn't happen to us. We kicked out the seven idol worshippers nations. They were not rising. They were defeated. 
so that we're not talking about them. So which enemy the Torah was talking about? These Arabs, today. 3,300 years later, everything that the Torah wrote happens day by day, night by night. Happening in front of our eyes. Someone made a funny movie. For me, I don't find it funny. It's actually very depressing. But you know Israeli humor. From every tragedy, they find a way to laugh. That's what happens when you're lightheaded. Your head is full of cabbage and straw instead of Torah. People are dying and you make fun and make uh, little films. What is the film? A scenario from school. Israeli teacher, of course a lefty, she asked a question in a class and, and she asked, who knows where the name Israel came from? One kid in a class get up. Uh, Ma'am, it came from the Tanakh. She said, Tanakh? How do you know about that book? Did you dare to read in it? Don't you know it's in a ban? You just committed a big crime. I have to report your parents to the police. How did they allow you to commit such a crime? Don't you know that this country is Palestine? You're not allowed to even hold the Tanakh in this country. Give it to me right away, you little criminal. That's the joke. It's not a joke, it's already happening now. You don't even have to wait 10 years or 20 years. It's already happening in Israel now. If you say to the teacher Tanakh, don't talk to me about these things here. This is public school here. Don't bring religion into the class. What happens if Ahmed brings Quran into the class? Yes, Ahmed, you know, we're very tolerant. What's the Quran? What's the Holy Quran say, Ahmed? Educate us. You, shh, don't talk to us about Tanakh. This is the lefties, Rabotai. You, you have a perfect example here in America, Jack Schumer. Bernie Sanders, those are the self-hated Jews. Those are the Erev Rav that Moshe Rabbeinu took out of Egypt. Those are the souls. Filthy, black, wicked souls. And in every generation will be cancer among our nation until they'll take Israel completely. They'll take it over. One of the prophecies of the Zohar that the Arabs will be in control in Israel for nine months. It started today. Today, they became for the first time in history a part of the government. The words of the Zohar, 2,000 years ago, the prophecy officially started a few hours ago. That means if that's what the Zohar referred to, this kind of government that will sit in a government, nine months from now, Purim, Benafochu, Purim. Wait, Rabotai, few more months. Few more months to the Shofar of Mashiach. And again, I want to remind you that not all of us will be there. In order for us to, to get saved when you hear the Shofar, you need to be fully Shomer Shabbat, not partially. No text, no phone, none of these things. Fully. Second, you have to be an honest person. Not a thief, not a crook, not charging interest from each other, Jews. Second. Third, if you're married, must keep tarat mishpacha. Without it, it's every day surekaret for you and your wife, Hashem irachem. And horrible children are born without it. So without that, you have a very serious problem. Four, you cannot touch any chametz and Pesach, obviously. It's also karet. Five, you do Yom Kippur exactly as it's required. No food, no drinks, no intimacy, no creams, no, no leather shoes. Praying, fasting, crying, making repentance. Every Yom Kippur. Six, if you are a woman, must be dressed fully modest all the time. Not like some modern orthodox wicked girls who walks with short sleeves and short skirt above the knees all the way up 
and attach clothes, everything stretched like this, attached to the body like a magnet. No modesty at all. It's worse than wearing pants. At least pants cover the whole legs. The way they dress is worse than, than wearing pants. And you, they were being warned many times, and they hear speakers, and they continue to dress like goyot. And they call themselves orthodox. And while they are machtiot arabim, they have no chance to see Mashiach. Obviously, machtiot arabim, they have three billions of sins accumulate to their account every year, just from the way they dress. Mashiach won't want to see them, because Hashem already said, When I see lack of modesty, I don't want to be near you. I can be near you. Seven, everybody here must fix his bed midot. Who can raise his hand and say that he has one midah that does not need improvement? Midah means personality trait. Let's give, let's give a list of the things we have to improve. If you think that one of them you already fixed, raise your hand. Okay, don't be embarrassed. First, pride goes together with ego. Pride. Who thinks he doesn't have pride and ego every day of his life? Baruch Hashem. Second, generosity. To give donations a lot. To be Baal Chesed. To let people borrow your car, borrow this. You need your talit, needs your tefillin, needs uh, food. I have extra you can take. Let me drive you where you need. Let me volunteer here. Let me volunteer there. Who thinks is good with chesed and generosity? Baruch Hashem. Three, honesty. So far everyone is honest here. You did not raise your hand for, for, for two times already. Honesty. Who can raise his hand and say that today did not say even one lie? And yesterday and the day before and every day of his life. Not even one lie. Okay, next, next, praying with devotion, emunah, counting on Hashem only, not counting on people. Who can say that he has emunah only in Hashem? That not his uncle will help him, or Uncle Sam, or his partner, or his this, or his that, or his in-laws. I'm only in the end of Hashem. That's another big problem. Another thing, watching the eyes from not seeing dirty things, internet, this, that. Today, even people wants to watch the news, they make isurim doraita in the news. Watching the news today, watching the news in Israeli or American uh, website or channels, news. I'm not talking Hollywood movies or Chas Shalom dirty movies. Watching the news is worse than eating pork. Literally. When you eat pork, you eat a steak of pork, you made one sin. You're not allowed to eat pork. When you go on the news, every five seconds they show a different video, a different picture, or the way the girls sit in a studio. Usually they never dress modest. They're not religious, what do you expect? So everything is open or clear, or attached, or all kinds of other things like that. And then they interview people on the street. There was an accident. What did you see? Tell us. Shem So as soon as you see, you look, you nechshal from the oraita. Lo taturu achre levavchem vachre einichem, sher atem zonim achareem. Don't follow what your eyes, it's like a radar. Don't let your eyes search for bad things. And finally, when they find something bad, you begin to focus and your imagination begins to work. That's already since from the Torah. So even to watch the news today, it cannot be without breaking the rules of the Torah. Even to watch the news. You may say, wait a minute, so what should we do? Should we just die and that's it? Because anyway, there's no way to be righteous. You can't even walk on the street. Walking in the street is like watching the news, same story. Oh, so when you walk in the street, better to bring your face down, not to look at people. First, you don't see how they look, how they dress. Second, you don't look at their faces because most people on the street are very wicked. So every wicked face you look into their face, it makes a damage to your soul. 
So why, why are you walking around and staring at people's faces? The less you look at people, the better it is for you. I lived in the Lower East Side for about a year or so, and there was a big tzaddik living there, Rav Ashri, the posek of the ghetto. He was in a camp. He was the rabbi of the camp. He has a book, the answers that he had to answer when people were in a, in a camp in Auschwitz, in those places. So I, I'm a witness. I followed him a few times on the street. He never lift, lift his face, never ever lifted his face from the ground. Always his face was looking at the floor. Never like this, never. Always like this with his cane. He was a short man walking in Manhattan. Never raised his face once. Just like the Torah required to watch your eyes. That's how you become such a holy person. There's no shortcuts in Judaism. No shortcuts in life in general. Shortcuts usually make things much longer later on. The only way to get fast to a high level is being connected to Torah day and night non-stop. That elevates you very fast. I'm going to give you an example. We have a yeshiva in Monsi. There's always an exception to the rule, but almost every student who joined the yeshiva in a low level, right, just started to become religious, a year later looks already ultra, ultra, orthodox, religious from birth. Meaning no one would imagine that he's only religious for one year. And when you begin to talk to him, the Torah, Gemara, you would think he's religious all his life. One year in yeshiva, one year. You can be Baal Tshuva here in Queens 50 years. No exaggeration. 50 years. Religious, keeping mitzvot, coming to shul. 50 years you would not know what he learned in one year in yeshiva. Is that a good enough shortcut for you? No. To survive Mashiach, you need Torah and Gmilut Chasadim. And also to fix the Midot. If you're full of ego, how are you going to see Mashiach? If you're very stingy, you never donate money. You never donate money. You know, you know I want to tell you something interesting. Every time I say, I speak about donations, right? Buy mitzvot. You should invest more in your maser, in Tukiruv. More than 50% of the donations are from Goim. The Goim take it to consideration more than us. And then it's, not another, it's not their obligation. It's a very smart thing for them to invest in. It's a great investment for them because the Goim also have life after death and they also can go to heaven. Imagine a Goy that thanks to his money, a hundred Jews got saved and they became religious. He's a king in the next world. King. No, no other Goy would reach his level. But the question is why so many Jews who listen and listen and listen, they don't open up their hands and their heart. It's very interesting, but I want to tell you something even more interesting. Remember two weeks ago, a week ago, I spoke in uh, Brooklyn about the special tefillin that I bought from Israel, that is top of the line and all that, it's all handmade. Three non-Jews asked me, can I order this tefillin? No matter how much it costs, I don't care. I was just in California now, when a guy that is, he wants to convert from Spanish descent. I told him, you know, maybe later, maybe you know, it's hard to get. I have limited the amount as it is. How much, how much? Tell me a quick, a quick pay to you right now. If I tell him $10,000, no question, in a second he would send it. Oh, now our Hasidish genius, he always has the answer to everything. He said, ah, they don't have resistance. The evil inclination, the guy is not obligated to put filling. He can, if he wants, he gets a reward for it. Same thing a woman would do. She's not obligated. So when you do a mitzvah that you're not obligated, you have no resistance like someone that is obligated. That's why it's when someone is obligated, he gets a, a bigger reward than someone that is not obligated. You may think a father of a pizza shop has a son, and a nephew, not nephew, a, 
the son of his brother, yeah, nephew. So the, his son and the cousin, they are now in a pizza shop. They saw that he got very busy, so they helped to clear the, the plates for, from the table. Who the father should reward more? His own son who helps to clear the tables or the son of his brother, the nephew, the cousin? You would say the cousin is not obligated. It's not his business. Why, why is he volunteering? Because he's a nice kid. He volunteered to help. He can go on and leave you here. It's not my problem. I'm not, you're not my father. So you would think that he should get a bigger reward than the son, right? Son, that's his business. He has to help. But the Torah say the other way around. Logically, you're right. But because you, you have, when you have an obligation, Hashem sends the evil inclination to resist you, to make it hard, because you are obligated, it becomes hard. When you are not obligated, it becomes a lot easier. And the proof of that is, I have a lot of goim over the years, 25 years of work. They used to donate before they became Jewish, a lot. And after they converted, it went down more than 90%. By almost all of them, except one woman. Except one woman, she gives less, but not because she, because she make less money than what she used to make. After she, and she got married, and she had more expenses. She's still very generous, even after she became Jewish. But all the other ones, you see right away, as soon as they became Jewish, the resistance right away started and grew. Why? Because it became a, a bigger obligation for them now to give those charities. So, we have to check the land. Do we have walls? That's a sign that they're weak. You should not be panic. They don't have walls. Oh, that means they are confident in themselves. That means they are very, very strong. The question is, why the verse say a Yoshev without Vav? Yoshev, Yud, Shin, Bet. It should be Yud, Vav, Shin, Bet, Yoshev. But it's missing a letter, Vav. And in Pasuk Yutet, it says Yoshev without Vav, and then one time with Vav. So in this parasha, one time you have the Yoshev with Vav, one time without it. The question is why? There's no coincidence in the Torah, you know. There's big secrets in this. The answer is, Moshe said to the to the spies to check three things. What are the three things Moshe told them to check? They are appear in those three words. Yoshev without Vav, another Yoshev without Vav, and another Yoshev with Vav. Those are the three things Moshe asked them. Right? For instance, let's see. Uritem et haaretz mai. Go check the land, what is it? Ve'et ha'am ha'yoshev alea, without vav. Yoshev without vav, when he speaks about the nation. Ha'chazak hu ha'rafea ha'me'at hu imrav. Are they a lot? Not a lot. How many are they? Umaretz asher hu yoshev ba, and the land. The land is good or not? Also yoshev without vav. Okay, and then the cities. The, are they surrounded with walls or not? Is Yoshev with Vav. This time he does have Vav. So the question is, what's the difference between Yoshev with Vav and Yoshev without Vav? Rashi explains that the first thing that Moshe asked them to check is, Et ha'aretz mahi. Check the land, what is it? Does it have heroes? Does it have weak people? Does it have a lot of people living there? Not that many people. What can make the country have strong people or weak people? What makes people strong and what makes people weak? 
The air starts with the air. If people breathe good air, that makes them healthier. Like in Japan, in the mountains of Japan, almost everybody past 100 years old. No smoke, no pollution, clear crystal uh, air over there. Unbelievable. And also, I guess, the weather of the place. And when, the, when the air is clean, people are healthier and stronger. How do you know that you don't know the air yet? You just came for the first day to check the land. One day it's not enough to know if the air is good or not. You look at the people. If they're all strong and build well, that means the air is good there. If not, the air is not good there. So, can, a, can a test like this be precise or it's just approximate? Maybe there's other factors. Who's to say that only the air, right? Maybe the bad air actually made people become strong because they got used to fight the condition, the bad condition. And now they are like vaccinated. And the nation of Israel that they never got used to such condition, maybe when they come there, they're too spoiled and it's going to make them very weak. So maybe it's the other way around. So you cannot go by the air. Second mission, Moshe say, check the actual land. The land is good or bad? Edit, Ziburit, Benonit, what is it? Do they have lakes? Does it have lakes? How do you check? Let's say the, the spies will drink from a lake here. Who's to say that the lake a hundred miles away from there is the same quality? The lake, how do you check the, the, the quality of the land? Right? Because even when the water are bad, they do not affect you immediately. Sometimes you can get affected a few days later if the water have germs or microbes, microscopic bad things in it. When you drink it, you don't feel anything. But then it develops into infection in your body and Chas Shalom can kill you. That's why you boil the water. When you boil the water, uh, af after the water reaches 80 degrees Celsius, all the germs there died. That's why they call milk pasteurized milk. Why pasteurized? After Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was a Jewish scientist in France who, while he was learning Mara, he got some ideas to invent a few things. One of the things he invented them, the vaccine to, against rabies. How to get skewered from that disease. And also he found out that if you heat the milk in 80 degrees, the milk will remain for a few days and will not get spoiled right away. That's why they call it pasteurized. Same thing when you buy grape juice. You buy those big Kedem bottles, you can keep it 10 years on the shelf. How is it possible it doesn't get spoiled? Be my guest. Take grapes, squeeze them into a bottle. Any grapes you want. Come back the next day while the bottle is in a fridge. Forget about in the heat. In the heat it will take an hour for, to, for it to spoil. Put it in the fridge. Squeeze regular grapes as they are natural. Put them in the fridge. Come back the next day after 24 hours, open it. It will sound like you open a bottle of seltzer. Or everything sour and spoiled. Why? So how do you keep now this grape juice 10 years on the shelf? Very simple. You boil it. That's why it's called mevushal. Yain mevushal. You boil it. Once you boil it, you don't need to go to 100 degrees when it's bubbling. 80 degrees, it already kill all the germs. It's pasteurized. That's why all grape juice, with very rarely they have some exception to the rule, are all pasteurized, all mevushal. So if a goy touch a grape juice, even if it doesn't say on it mevushal, you don't have to spill the bottle. 
or if Mechalel Shabbat touch it, since it was pasteurized, it's like cooked, you don't have to throw it to the garbage. The only wine that you have to throw to the garbage if Mechalel Shabbat touch or a goy is that it says on it, not mevushal. It was not cooked. When you go to a kosher restaurant, they never use fat bottles. They always use the skinny ones. Did you know why? Why they uh, always have the small ones? Because the big ones are not mevushal. Because it's for families, for the house. But the skinny ones are mevushal. When the goy waiter opened the bottle and he pour it for you in a fancy restaurant, it's no problem. Why? Because it's mevushal wine. The problem is that for us, we don't understand so much about wine anyway. We cannot tell the difference. If, if somebody tells you, close your eyes, and he let you taste from the wine, you go like this. Once it's mevushal, and once it's not mevushal, most likely most of us will not be able to tell the difference. But if you give it to a French guy that drinks everyday wine with his steak, ooh la la, as soon as you give him the mevushal with his eyes closed, yeah, spit it in your face. Make sure you don't go with a nice clothes when you do that. Ugh! What happened? Terrible. What is this? You can feel right away the difference. Not only that, in France, France and Italy are places that they know how to make wine the best in the world. Italian wines are very good, and French wine. And some of their bottles are very expensive. 20,000 a bottle it could be. So when you go to the vineyard where they make the wine in a cold, under the ground places with barrel, it's to be a cool place. They have a big sign over there. Women either are not allowed at all, or they sign, they have a sign, women in a time of period are not allowed to enter. Why is it? Because the period affects the wine. It's unbelievable. The ruach, the impurity of the period, of the nida, actually make damage to the wine. This the goim even understand. And it's very interesting. Two things are the opposite, perfume and wine. When you make perfume, a dek a dek, right? When you make perfume, it's good to make noise, to talk a lot. Whatever you do, you talk. When you talk, all this squeezing those leaves, this, you know, and makes perfume for that, the more talking, the better quality the perfume becomes. That's what Chazal telling us. But wine has to be quiet. The more noise you make, the more damage you make. Not only that, I saw once a little clip, video, two flowers. One flower, a woman that is in her period, she touched, and the other one, they didn't give her permission to touch. They came after a few hours, the one she touched died completely. Some rabbis in the world never let woman, any woman cook for them. Because they don't know, she has a period, not, I'm not going to start asking questions. They make sure only male cook for them. Whatever food they get served, only by male. Huh? Can Bishul Gvarim. Why? Because maybe she was in a, in a time of Nida, and Nida is big impurity. If you're still not convinced, maybe the Holy Zohar will convince you that according to the Holy Zohar, a woman that she's in a time of Nida should not come to the synagogue. And if she did come to the synagogue, she should not look at the Sefer Torah. Needless to say, God forbid to touch it. You Hasid, you gotta come here one Shabbat and see when they take the Torah from behind me, they go to the women's section and all the Persian, Bukharian women go like this. And some of them touch and kiss. By Hasidim, they don't. 
No, but by you, you do Agba after, uh, after you're reading the Torah, right? You, when you finish, do Agba, one, two, three, one person sit, you roll it, and finish. My Sfaradim is a whole party, ceremony. One person go around, sometimes it can take five, five minutes. Yeah. So, Rashi continued to explain based on that what we said if people are strong or not not knowing based on the water because maybe the water will affect you later on when Elisha the prophet arrived to Jericho the people of the city told him Moshav Ha'ir Tov Ka'asher Adoni Ro'e this is a good city as you see Ve'amayim Ra'im but the water are bad. Too many people are dying. Why? There's no good quality water. I told Elisha, as you see, people are dying here because of the quality of the water. So the Gemara, the Gemara asks, if it's a bad country, a bad city, and the water are bad, so what's good in this city that they say to Elisha, this is a very good city? <laughs> People in Miami also say it's a very good city. In Las Vegas, they also say it's a very good city. Everywhere I go, people say, wow, it's a great place here. Right or wrong? People that live in Sodom, they didn't think it's a good city? I think people get used to the place. They think it's a good place. The Gemara answer, Chen makom al yoshvav. The beauty of the place on his people. Why? Meaning, that's only good for people that live here for many, many years. But the people that just moved here or just born here, they don't have the beauty of the place of them. What does it mean, the beauty of the place? Chenamakom, you know, the air that you breathe in every place in the world affects you differently. If you move with your wife and children now to China and you are regular people, you don't have uh, Oriental eyes. So if you will marry Chinese people, obviously your children will have Oriental eyes. At least there's a chance for it. But what happens if you live there 500 years without intermarried? You go a group of people, 100 Jews, Hasidim. They move to China and they live in a closed area hundred uh, families, 500 people, and they, may, they start marry each other. They're all Jews, but they live in China 500 years, 10 generations, uh, 20 generations. What will happen to all the grand-grand-grandchildren? Still be Hasidish, but will have Orientalized. Maybe even they won't have beards, because a lot of Orientals don't have beards. They don't have thick beards, like Mexicans, they have very little beard growing. Ladinos, Latinos, they also some of them have. Orientals, some of them barely have a little beard only here, but not here. So it's a fact, the air that they breathe in that place slowly, slowly change the genes, as the Zohar said. The Zohar said that the image of the people is determined based on the air that they breathe in every kind of continent. That's why in China you have two billion people and they all look like twins. They all look alike. All have black straight hair. You ever saw blonde Chinese? One. Did you ever see? No. Did you ever see Chinese with curly hair? They all have straight hair. All have similar eyes. Usually they slim and thin. When I was in China I was looking for one fat guy. One. Everywhere. I saw a million people in one day. Now one of them was heavy. Everyone slim. What's going on? What, nobody here is hungry? Nobody here eats here a little bit more than what uh, is allowed to eat? Doesn't matter, eat, doesn't eat. They stay very, very... Not only that, the Israelis who move to Guangzhou cannot find shoes there. Some of them are big. <laughs> they come to the store, it's all small shoes. There's no big shoes. They have to import shoes from different places. Because the store doesn't have customers with the 11, size 11, size 12. They don't have. It's all eight, eight and a half, seven. <laughs> Why? The jeans. 
in, in Scandinavia. Everyone blonde, blue eyes. Everyone blonde. You don't see black people in Scandinavia unless they move there. That became black over there. It doesn't happen. So what do you see? The Jews look like all nations. Why? They have Chinese Jews, black Jews, uh, uh, Scandinavian Jews, Irish Jews, everybody with his image. Moroccan, Arab Jews, looks like Arab. Why? Because they live all over the world for the past 3,000 years, 2,000 years at least. It's affecting the genes. Ah, almost finished. Why would the spies dare to say the opposite of what Hashem said? Hashem said, this is the land of milk and honey. And I'm going to give you the land, and you're going to sit there, and you're going to build Bet HaMikdash. That's it. Once Hashem said all these words, I understand that I have to plan a strategy in a war. We have to do Ishtadlut. But overall, the destiny is already determined. We must go to Israel. We must build Bet HaMikdash. That was the whole plan all along. So what's to worry so much? Now they come and they say, oh, we saw giants there, lots of funerals. It's a horrible place. We're not going to be able to win them. Who told you to give commentary? What, you became Rashi? You just have to report what you saw. Do not add your own opinions from the university. Do not add. Meaning, I send you on a mission to take pictures. Well, who do you want me to take pictures? Take picture of this girl, Miriam. Follow her for one week and take pictures of her. Why? Why? I want to know if she's good for my son. I want to know how she dress. I want to know to what store she enter. I want to see how she behave. I want to see what she does. If you can listen to what music she has in her earring. What kind of phone she's holding. What meat she buys in a supermarket. There's, well, there's things to check. The spy is a private detective. He has to take pictures and make some recordings, right? Or videos. Imagine he comes to the father of the boy and he say to him, she does this and she listens to this music, which is very bad because people over there listen to it. He already brings his own commentary. And she wore the stocking, but the stocking, there is a company who makes something even better than that. And that, and I heard this, and I heard that, and that rabbi said that this meat is not kosher. Excuse me! Excuse me! I didn't tell you to become Rashi. Just take pictures, record, and bring me the results. That's the mistake they made. Everything they said technically was true. They really saw funerals. They saw giants. They saw huge foods. They saw all these things. They saw seven nations. They saw how they live, they saw walls. They basically said what they, what they, but they added commentary. And they made everybody start to go into panic mode and crying. And then she got very upset. And why did they do that? Why did they do that? I'll give you an example. If your friends say, I want to leave the community and move to that city, First thing comes to your mind is, wow, I'm going to lose a good friend. Oy vey, such bad news. But he asks for your advice. Can you come with me and tell me if the place I'm about to buy, the apartment is good? You, you have, you're smart, you will see things maybe I didn't see. So you come around and you already come with a negative approach because you want to do everything you can that he won't leave town. You already made up your mind. So in your subconscious, you are so worried that this friend is going to leave you and you lose him as a friend in a town. So automatically you focus on all possible negative things you can say. So you come, you see the house is big. There's nothing to say. Kitchen is beautiful, nice. 
building, good elevator, first floor, don't have to walk on Shabbat, good air condition, good schools, good yeshivot. You're looking, you're looking. When will I find something bad? Then you hear the noise across the street from the children. Recess. Ah, children, noise. Ah, I shouldn't move here, Moshe. Ah, your wife will go crazy. Imagine this all day until 5 p.m. all day. Children, look how much noise they make. If it was a guy that is dying to get rid of, he would not bring it up. So it's selective, a selective review. Huh? You have to be biased, 100%. And Hashem knows that the reason they do it is politics. Politics. Why some heads of community gives a lot of respect to wicked rich people that come to Daven in their shul? He say money. What if I would tell you that this rich guy did not give a penny yet? That's the whole point. They're cooking him now. <laughs> Giving him a lot of kiss up, respect, compliments. Hoping. Hoping. At one point he will write the check. What would happen if he's already in a shul two years and he never writes a check? One of these bunker, bunker. Then what? Would he still make him sit next to him on the stage? No. He will send him to the back of the line. You, come here. Your watch looks nicer than his. Come here. Sit here. Now, I want to ask you. This is a good approach or this is lack of emuna in Hashem? Lack of emuna in Hashem. That's lack of, lack of emuna. But I have a question to you. If a rabbi is a rabbi of a community and he has 500 people in his shul, it's hard to be a babysitter of each one of them, right? And from the 500 people, he has 20 that actually sponsor the whole place. They pay the bills, they pay the mortgage, they pay the food, the meals, they bought the Sefer Torah, they, you know, they pay the water. Anything the shul needs, the shul needs tables, they buy it. Rabbi, I take my credit card, buy this. The, the, the place needs a car, they lease a car for the shul. Those 20, basically without them there's no shul. Now the rabbi comes home and he has 10 messages on his, uh, on his answering machine. Like he used to be in the old days. Remember, you come, you have 10 messages. You listen to all of them, you write down their number. From the 10 people, three of them were from the list of 20, the VIP guys. And the seven others do not contribute anything to the synagogue. Not that they're cheap, they may not have. This guy is a driver, this guy is a teacher. They don't have money, they can't give a lot of money. Now what is the obligation of the rabbi? Should he treat all 10 people that left a message equally, or he must first call the three that support his place? It's a good question. Why am I asking you this? If you say he has to call the three people first, then you would say it's not fair. What, people that give money, you treat them better than us just because we don't have, you don't give us the same treatment? Ega. And if you say, no, you have to treat all of them equal, then, they, then someone will tell you, excuse me, you're very ungrateful. I mean, we're not saying that the seven who do not contribute to anything, it's their fault. No one blames them. But here you have three that thanks to them you have what you have. And the other seven also benefit from it. They should come first. What is the right thing to do? Of course, what I'm saying is that when he doesn't have time to call all 10, it's limited time, that's just 20 minutes now, and he may not, have, not be able to call back all 10 today. Now, you don't know, the, Rabbi, I have a problem, please call me. All 10 messages like this. You don't know. Obviously, if one, if one of the seven has a life risk situation, then you don't even consider to call anyone else. You have to start with him, fine. 
So the answer is the Torah taught us thousands of times to be grateful people. If you treat a person who supports you equally like someone who does not support you, you are an ungrateful human being. It's not fair. Oh, it's not fair. He's rich. He can support. Go to Hashem. Write a complaint. Go to the Western Wall, put a note. It's not fair. Moshe in the shul gets more attention than the, from the rabbi than me because he, he pays for all the expenses. And you didn't give, not give me money to pay, so I cannot pay. That's why I get the call last. The complaint is to Hashem, not to the rabbi. Therefore, a lot of people complain, oh, over here they only respect people that have money. That's not true. They respect them because they support the shul or the yeshiva. I've seen in my own eyes one big chacham, chacham. Now one time I, I wanted to talk to him about a problem that we had. It was 20 something years ago. And a rich guy from Monsi arranged a meeting between me and him. We had to go to Manhattan to an office of some very rich guy, big, huge office in Manhattan. And the rabbi met us in this office of the rich man. It was Friday morning. We went there, we parked the car, we went up. You had to see the treatment the rabbi was giving to the guy who took me there. Got him 10 books with dedication. Before he even talked to me, half an hour he gave him attention. After that, he spoke to me another 20 minutes. But it was all first. It looked obvious that the only reason he agreed for the meeting is really to meet him. Then on the way back, I asked him, why he gives you such a respect? Because I give a lot of money to his yeshiva. You understand? That's called, that's called gratefulness. If you don't, if you don't if it's called a karata tov. If you don't recognize the good that people do for you, what good you are? What good you are? Hashem did not want Amun and Moab to convert for not bringing bread and water. Basically one dollar, that's it. If he's a wicked person, you're not allowed to show him any respect and gratitude in public. But when you are alone with him, you still have to thank him for what he does and give. But not in public. That's dangerous. Why? Because other people in the shul that are righteous, they see that the rabbi treat this wicked person like a king. Just because he gives money, what are they going to say? Wait a minute. Why are we working so hard to keep Shabbat and to learn Torah and to be honest and that when this guy gives you checks and already is better than us? And it's not worth it to be so righteous. All you have to do is to make money, to be a crook like him, and to give a lot of charity, no? Tell, tell it to them. Usually, I mean, people don't get it. Also, people will understand that him being wicked is not so bad like we thought. They may learn that what I do is not so bad, so maybe I can be also like him, a little bit less religious. Right? So also, it shows to the people if the rabbi gives them a lot of respect, knowing he's Mechalel Shabbat, knowing he's a, not such a good person, knowing he does bad things. That means the rabbi himself is corrupted. Because a righteous, decent person is allergic to wicked people. Allergic. And I know that some speakers say otherwise and uh, they spread some baloney here and there. And they say, don't be judgmental. Don't be judgmental. What does it mean, don't be judgmental? Show me one person in the world that has one hour on his life, one hour in his life that is not judgmental. One hour. You get on a bus. You look at 20 people that sit, white, black, Chinese, Arab, German. I'm sitting next to this one. That's judgmental. Why I didn't go to sit next to this gorilla? It's intimidating. Ah, maybe he's a, such a sweet person. Everyone that looks like a gorilla is a gorilla? No. Some people look very scary. As soon as he opens up, he says, hi, how are you? Oh, very nice. It's so nice. Right? Right or wrong? Or, or, you know, you, you see a police car, 
immediately you make a U-turn. Why? Police are bad people. You hear it on the media all the time. So you judge, maybe this cop is a nice, righteous guy. No, no, for sure he's going to come after me. Why? That's being judgmental. You go to the bank, you go to the supermarket, you choose the cashier, you go to the immigration here in JFK, and you don't want to get into trouble, you want to walk in smooth, so you check. This guy looks the nicest. Everyone with what looks nice to him. One would prefer white, one would prefer black. If you're black, you probably would prefer black. If you're white, you probably would prefer... If you're Chinese, you probably would prefer uh, Oriental, no? Because everybody, oh, we are brothers, we are from the same nation, you know? What's the proof of that? Johnny Cochran, you know him? The, the lawyer of O.J. Simpson and Shapiro, the other Jewish lawyer. They made sure that at least half of the jury of O.J. will be black. They insisted. They did not agree to all white jury. Why? All we need is four or five blacks, and the jury will never reach a unanimous uh, verdict. If it would be a Hasid, if I would be his lawyer, I would try to get half of the jury to be Hasidish. Right? Why? Hasid doesn't send Hasid to jail. They do everything they can to prevent it. That's why this whole jury system is stupid, unfair, and very corrupted. Never reach justice there, never. Because there's always enough that one person would like you because you're a beautiful woman. And his heart does not let you send you to jail. And you really think they tell them the truth, right? They come to Mendel. Mendel, what's your name? Mendel Horowitz. Uh, are you biased? You know, this, man, this uh, Itzhak uh, Rosenberg is uh, convicted in this and this and that. Do you think you can have a fair trial? Of course. What is going to say? No, 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 I love him. He's a chassid. I'm sending him free. Don't waste your time. Call it off. He's not guilty. What do you think he's going to say? What do you think the black guy is going to say? Oh, OJ... O.J. is a saint. Of course, there's no chance that O.J. killed her. He's not going to say, excuse me, are you racist? Are you biased? Of course I'm biased. Are you racist? No, God forbid. What is he going to say? Yes? It's baloney. This whole thing is baloney. If you can hypnotize the jury in every trial, after the fact, you will see how much I'm right. You see, based on what they reach their verdict, all kinds of opinions and racism and this and that. Yes, 100%. So everyone is judgmental. If an Arab gets on the bus in August with a coat, maybe he has fever, maybe he has fever, poor Arab, poor Ahmed. Maybe he had a bad night, he didn't sleep all night, so he decided to wear a coat. Right? In a plane, people wear coat because of their condition, even though it's very hot, summer now. I just came back from LA. Some people wore coats and blankets even. They put uh, Delta have great AC. Not like other airlines that cook you in sauna inside to save another two dollars on air condition. So what happened? You you know now you on a flight. And uh, how did I get to the flag? <laughs> I get to the flag. Ah, with a coat. Oh, so the Arab gets to the bus on August with a coat. He gets on the bus with a coat. Half of the Israelis get off the first stop. Arab scream, shame on you. You racist, judgmental. Just because I'm Arab, you get off? Why do you think I'm a terrorist? Why do you think all Arabs are terrorists? Better be safe than sorry, Ahmed. <laughs> How many people go in August in 95 degrees with 100% humidity on a bus with a coat? Probably a terrorist. In the end, he was really sick. No bum. Why you are judgmental? Now, do you think Hashem will punish them for suspecting Ahmed for being a terrorist? What do you think? Absolutely not. 
If you wouldn't, the Torah tell you, I did not commend you to be stupid. If you go, again, you should know racism in America, it's defined incorrectly. Everything for them is racism. Racism, if you hate people because of the color of their skin, regardless if they're good or bad, that's racism. Racism, if you hate all Jews, whether they're good or bad, that's racism. But living in a place when uh, there are uh, people, certain kind of people, you know, and over there the level of crime is 80% more than other places, these kind of people commit a lot more crimes and you are judgmental towards them and you're extra careful, or you worry when they come near you, that's not being a racist. That's being careful based on facts and statistics. So if you come to Dubai as a Jew, you don't have to worry that someone will stick a knife to the back. It's civilized Arab, they want business. Only 15% of Dubai are Arabs. 85% are Indians and Thailandim and, and servants. 15% rich Arabs, 85% servants. That's, that's what's going on in, the, in there. So, same thing in Qatar and all these places. Almost everybody there, in the end, these, that, in hotels, they all work, the drivers. They don't have anything to kill you. And plus, the Arabs there are so rich, they have a lot to lose. It's not Arabs that need a salary from Iran. In Gaza, you have two ways to make a living. One is to be a murderer, terrorist, because Iran will pay you a salary to join the Hamas. Or to be a builder, construction. There's no other way to make a living there. Or well, maybe if you're a mechanic, you have a garage, yes, but in general. So a lot of people do not know how to work in construction, or they, wanna, they don't want to work in the sun. So they join the Hamas, they get a salary. If they die, their family gets a salary for life. It's a place of work. And they love their job very much. It's killing two birds with one stone. Getting a few thousand dollars salary and killing Jews. What can be better than that? That reminds me of a story, and we'll finish here. It reminds me of a story that uh, Titus, he came to destroy Bet Amikdash. Titus from Romy, Rome. You have in Rome a gate with picture of the Jewish slaves bringing the menorah to Rome, to the, to the Vatican there. It's in the Vatican under the ground until today. So Titus, when he came to Bet HaMikdash to destroy it, he went into the parochet, he stacked the sword into the parochet, and Hashem fooled him, and blood splashed out. And this fool, he thought, wow, I killed their god. So the Jews worshipping this area, he didn't know what it is. So he stabbed it and blood came out. So I killed their god. So he took the parochet and he put all the Jewish utensils, treasury, all this gold, put everything inside, put it on a boat, took some slaves with it, took the menorah, and they went back to Rome, to Rome, Italy probably a few days. So on the, in the, on the ocean, a storm started. Pshhh, tsunami. He said, oh, I, I thought I killed their god, but I see I didn't. So, oh, I know who you are. You, you're a hero only on water. That's what you did to Paro, that's what you did to Sisra. When it comes to water, you're very good to, of killing the enemies of the Jews. But I'll give you a challenge. Let's see if you can defeat me on the land. And, and the water, that's your territory. Let's see if you can overcome a fight with me in the land. <laughs> Hashem said, on the land? Let it be on the land. He came to the land. Ha! Ah, who? Ha! Ah, hey! Where? Who are you fighting, you fool? Where is he? Hashem brought a mosquito. went into his nose. While he was breathing, it was very small, very small, those flies. Went inside to his head and went all the way to his brain and started to suck the blood in his brain, in those little veins, sucking more and more. There's only one problem, mosquitoes, 
is the only creature who does not ever go to the bathroom. They only take in, but there's no exits. Nothing goes out, so they constantly go until they die. And they don't live that long. They just suck blood and more and more, and they die. So now he's sucking his blood more, and, and he hears inside, you know, this noise that they make? Oh my gosh. So what happened? One time he walked by a bunch of workers who banged the hammers on the on a steel. Boom, boom, boom. Huh? Blacksmith? Blacksmith? No, no, blacksmith is lux. Blacksmith. They black or they white? I got it. Blacksmith. We learn another word after so many years. No Hashem. So the blacksmith, boom, boom, and the mosquito got nervous, he heard this banging, stop whistling. Titus, after a, a while, had a moment of break. I found a solution to my problem. He went to these five guys, I'm hiring you. Close everything, I'm the king, come with me. <laughs> What's the job? All day you sit by my palace and bang and I'll pay you daily. They came, what well, can be better than that? Don't have to wait for customers, clean uh, fixed shoes. They bang, and the mosquito is in shock. All day, boom, boom, boom. The end of the day, they stand in line, they come to get paid. Each one of them is supposed to get, let's say, 100 bucks. So the first one, a guy came, gives him. Second, third, the fourth one was a Jew. The Jew came, this yamaka and beard. He said, get out of here. So what happened? He said, not only you sit here and see all day your enemy suffer torture like I do, you want to also get paid for it? You want money for that? All day you see how much I'm suffering with this banging that I suffer from this mosquito. Get out of here. So that's like the Arabs. Join the Hamas and we'll pay you $4,000 a month for it. I'll do it for free. It's like these black NBA stars. All their life play basketball in the neighborhood. Then they go to college. They play basketball, which they would do anyway for free for the rest of their life because they can't live a day without it. They love sport. And one day they say, oh, we're going to sign you up and pay you $20 million a year. And if they offer him 20000 a year, he wouldn't do it? Of course he'll do it. He can live without it. Any amount he will do it. But now with the agent, the expert agent, they open up their eyes. Don't be a fool. Hey, you're a good player. They make millions in a stadium. Don't worry, I'll, I'll design for you a new contract. Now you have to pay them hundreds of millions of dollars. Now if you tell them, we're going to lower your contract by one million, so instead of ten a year, it's going to be nine, they won't play. They already got used to it. But in reality, what can be a better job to do what you love the most, which you will do either way? Imagine you get paid to eat. You have to eat every day, so now this is no problem. Every day you're going to eat, we'll pay for your meal, and we give you $500 a day for eating. <laughs> With or without you, I would eat. No, but we would like to contribute. We'll give you $500 for eating. Can it be a better job than that? You do what you do anyway, and you love to do it, and you get paid for it. Huh? Very good. Bezrat Hashem, this coming Sunday, I have a, an event with Ravron and Shaulov. Abayron and Shaulov is a brave speaker from Israel, speaks very strong in Hebrew and in Russian, doesn't speak English. And he is one of the only few that still speak today in the world very strong, very strong Musar, and he's brave. Why brave? Because he speaks against the authorities and the Israeli Supreme Court and these dirty politicians that we spoke about them an hour ago on the open in a country that is very communist and there's no freedom of speech to righties. There's only sp freedom of speech to lefties. Same thing in America. 
Trump today closed his uh, page after a month that he opened it. Why? Twitter and Facebook don't let Trump have a page. So he needed to open uh, some different media. Today he closed it. People did not show interest what's going on over there. But someone said that the reason he closed it because he's about to launch his own social media network. Remember I said that three months ago that that's what he should do? The day he lost the election, remember Avram? I have a feeling he listens to all the lectures. He, or at least his daughter and his son-in-law. I say you have 80, 90 million voters, plus your enemies will be very curious to see what you say. So basically you have 150 million guaranteed to go into your page. That's already a trillion dollar business in the next 20 years. You're gonna, you can sell commercials, but it's gonna be only righties. This time you shut the mouth of all these lefty traders. Only righties. Same thing Facebook is only lefties and Twitter over here only righties. It's against our policies to complement the Hamas and Hezbollah. Now there's a big mystery. Some people say Hassan Nasrallah in Machshimo is dead. I personally don't think he died. These people have seven different souls somehow. Nasrallah. But the last speech he gave, he was coughing non-stop. He could not say a sentence. He had corona. So he was keep coughing and choking. Now they say he may die. Well, we'll find out in the next two, three days. And if he did die, should we be happy? There is 5,000 like him waiting online to take his place. Me? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. When uh, some Israelis, they're happy, Israel bombed 20 terrorists. In one shot, they die. The second you kill 20 terrorists, 200 were born that minute. In 18 years, you'll see. So you, you're going backwards. Hashem Yatzilenu. We're going into new days, Rabotai. That's it. Lefty government, Arabs controlling us. Haters of Torah, haters of yeshivot. Now every one of us has to elevate himself spiritually to the highest maximum. I have a very strong feeling that in a few months it's all going to be over. That's mamash the final stage before the end. Mi ya'ale be'ar Hashem, umi akum bimkom kotsho, neki chapayim uvar levav. Purify your heart, purify your hands. Multiply, triple, quadruple all your donations. Give a lot. Now it's not time to be stingy now. The more tzedakah you give, the more you save yourself. The more. Even give some to your children, the young children, to give also. It will save their life as well. Tzedakah tatzil mimavet. Tzedakah is the best protection against death. Also helps. Also helps. If you give, I give for the security and the health of my family, also help. Very much. That's what people have to do. Because remember, even if we die, we do not want to come to the court of heaven knowing that we left all our money in our bank accounts and we had an opportunity to save ourselves from a horrible hell. And as results of our stinginess and stupidity, we didn't do it. And now we're going to kill ourselves double. Once for leaving so much money here unused. And second, for being so much punished, which we could prevent it by giving a lot of tzedakah. Remember, tzedakah, if you invest in a Talmud Yeshiva, Issachar and Zvulun. Let's say you have a guy, he just got married, him and his wife. You give them in America $3,500 a month for everything, rent, everything. But he learns the whole month, all his Torah goes to your account, to him and to you. Millions of mitzvot every week. Millions of mitzvot. Now, if you're a wealthy person, what $3,500 for these billionaires that we have around here? There's rich people, they spend on a, on a dinner $3,000. They go with the family and the kids. What is it for them? to buy millions of mitzvot by sponsoring a guy like this. 
או you can sponsor boys in my yeshiva. 500 lousy dollars a month, that's it, it's nothing. What's 500 dollars? One suit per month. And the boy learns all month, single, uh, 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 Avrechim, married ones, with his family, but you don't get, like Issachar and Zvulun. Issachar and Zvulun means you have to pay all his expenses, everything. He doesn't have anything to worry about. But over here, you get a, a share in his Torah. All his Torah. And if it's somebody who teaches Torah, even better. You, own, you gain from his learning, and you gain from the, all the other people who learn from him. This is how it goes. It's fantastic spiritual business. The people that invested their money on mansions and on fancy sport cars like California, you don't you see any bad car there. You count a thousand cars, all of them is $100,000 and up. All Ferraris and Rolls Royce and tons of Mercedes and BMWs and Lamborghinis and so many rich people over there. Among the Jewish community as well. I'm not saying they're not giving tzedakah, but when they come to the world of truth, they will eat their heart very much for the Ferrari and Lamborghini and the Bentley. Because Hashem for sure, for sure guarantee, no doubt about it, will be very angry at them and tell them, if you drove a Toyota, let's say, 30, 40,000, drive smooth, nice, powerful SUV, or regular sedan, you would suffer so much? You needed to have a Bentley, 300, 400,000 dollars? Why didn't you take the extra 280,000 that you spend on that stupid car and support the Kolel for three years with that and get 100 billion mitzvot? What are you gonna get for the Bentley? Deeper hell. That's what you're gonna get. And I'm gonna get a reward for it, for the show off and for the Chilul Hashem, the way you live. That's, in the world of the truth, a person will go crazy for spending $50,000 on a watch. It will go crazy. I, I told you the story about one rich guy in Monsi, him and his brother, they sponsored 10 yeshivas in Israel. And he lives in the most simple way. You have to see his house. Nothing could be cheaper than the way the house built. Station wagon car. Regular, very simple clothes. You will never guess this guy is multi, multi-millionaire. As a matter of fact, I actually said that in one of the lectures here a month ago, and now someone came to me in the show and said, who are you are talking about? Is it this guy? <laughs> I said, how many guys you know that have millions of dollars and 95% of what they have they give to Torah? And they live in the most simple way. How many guys you know? How many guys you know that they bring a family of a boy that has cancer because he needs treatment here, and they rent him a house all year, and they pay all the expenses, and the person lives in a better condition than the wealthy guy? How many people you know that when they go to buy a suit for themselves, they're going to spend $100, and then they buy a suit for Bachur Yeshiva, they're going to spend 300 Buy him something good. For me, that's all. For him, give him this. You understand, Rabbi Baruch Hashem. That's okay, no, I'm sorry. But you got the point or no? So, that's a hero. Imagine somebody like this come to Hashem. They announce his name in the court of heaven. All the rich people should come and learn. This is what I expected from each one of you. All of you failed, and he's the king of the world. And that's when they're going to kill themselves. Wow, what a fool I was. What a fool I was. I go crazy. Forever, though. For eternity. I had the opportunity. And in the end, I did not gain anything. And I died, and the money went to my children who fight and kill each other and became enemies because of that, which happens a lot to those rich people. Unbelievable. <sighs> that Hashem now will have some mercy on us after the horrible few months of judgment. And hopefully, even though it right now looks very discouraging, hopefully, hopefully, we say in Hebrew, me'az yetzem matok. 
something good may come out of it. We may see the honey, we don't see it yet. We will wait and see. Baruch Adonai Lo'olam, Amen ve'Amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia, Amen.